verse number 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but always uh, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. If in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Uh, we'll, we'll look at these from the standpoint of making sure that we understand from from what's actually there in the text, uh, in the Greek, uh, as much as possible. Mainly because um, the NIV gets a little stylistic in its, in, in its uh, translation here. And not that it's off point, um, I wouldn't say that, but I think in some respects it, uh, here and there it's a little, uh, a little off point, even if it's still um, good from the standpoint of the general tenor of what's taught in Scripture. So having said all that, uh, let's, uh, let's get into this. Um, we start off uh, with the very first one. Now, the NIV says love must be sincere. Uh, is that a good way of seeing that? Very, very much it is so. Uh, literally, uh, the, uh, it says here in the scripture, let love, not, uh, let, let love be not hypocritical. Uh, that would be a very literal rendering of that. Let love not be hypocritical. Now, when we think about a word like hypocritical, I think most of us understand what that, what that is all about. Sincere is a good way of looking at something that is not hypocritical. Hypocritical means that it appears one way on the surface, but underneath something else is going on. Uh, someone may come and smile at you, shake your hands, and give you a very pleasant greeting. Maybe something else is going on in their heart and their mind, maybe just the opposite, in which case that would be hypocritical, that kind of thing. Our love uh, in the body of Christ, our love uh, between one another uh, in particular, is something that needs to be sincere and without hypocrisy. Um, then he goes on into the next area, hating evil, glued to what is good. Um, again, an NIV has hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Uh, is that uh, a good way of rendering that? Yes, it is. Uh, the word cling here literally uh, means glue. And so the Greek word that's used there is, is glue, uh, is you know, uh, a verb for glue. So uh, hating evil glue to what is good. Um, I know that at times in our attempt to follow after Christ, at any given day, at any given moment, we're under a certain level of temptation or a, a certain level of, of testing um, a lot of things, um, a lot of things come our way that would try to knock us off line, if you will. Um, and the, uh, uh, the the danger that we have is that sometimes I don't think that we uh, estimate our weakness greatly enough. Uh, maybe we underestimate our milieu, our, our environment, and don't realize really how dead set against us most of what's around us is. I mean, you put yourself in any situation that may seem even innocuous, um, but I guarantee you that the, the, the devil is, is uh, running around uh, roaring like a lion, seeking someone to devour. And so um, the minute that we almost think that we stand, right, that's when we need to watch out lest we fall. And so 
we need we need to have it conceptually I think something that's a little stronger than just kind of assuming that we're going to be good kind of assuming that you know we understand what God's asking for us and we'll pull it off um, we maybe need to strengthen our, our sense of how much we really need to be um, grasping laying hold of making some um, soulish effort to do a little bit more than just have uh, good in the general area. We need to cling to it. We need to be glued to it. Because if we're not, um, like almost anything that's moving, you know, moving around, if it's you know, if, on a ship or an airplane, if it's, if it's not uh, bolted down, if it's not glued down, what happens when you get into turbulence? What happens when you face some waves? Things start moving around and some of the things you don't want to move around so much. And so uh, we need to just understand that uh, our conception, our commitment to the kind of, uh, the kind of inner being uh, that's necessary for us as followers of Christ is something that loves the good so much that, that in our mind, in our heart, we see ourselves um, exercising a stickiness that just won't let go. Uh, don't uh, fall asleep. Don't fall asleep at the wheel. Um, there's always danger in that. And then we go on to the next one. We're going through these one after another because there's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, tenderly uh, loving one another uh, in brotherly love. Uh, treat one another as a family. Is a little note that I put in here to try to help you understand what's there. Now the NIV, the NIV. Um, the NIV uh, it, it, it's not quite on point here. Uh, it's not that it's a bad translation, it just uh, isn't full enough. Be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Um, now, uh, that first phrase that the NIV has there, be devoted to one another in love, that's what you see here, tenderly loving one another in brotherly love. Um, the, the phrase in the Greek is a little cumbersome because you have the mention of familial love twice. So you have a sense where, where, where Paul is almost saying, have familial love as you love your family. You know, it, it's kind of repeated. And so when you see that kind of thing happen, generally speaking, uh, you're seeing an emphasis you know, in, in the Bible. And so uh, there's an emphasis in this phrase. And that emphasis is on uh, you know, on, on Philadelphia, on, on brotherly love. And so this is really telling us that we, we need to not just give mouth service to this. This is something that we need to take seriously and something that we actually need to dedicate ourselves to practicing. Um, this is probably, if I have a beef uh, from the standpoint of being an idealistic, uh, faithful person, when I look at the church, is that, that basically not any, not this particular body, but the church in general, is that this is really something that is not really paid attention to all that much in the general, in the general uh, church of God. Um, people really don't dedicate themselves to loving the people around them as if they're family, uh, as if they're your brother. Uh, this is what we're called to. This is what church is supposed to be. And if church is something less than that, well then, you know, then we have to get back to the scripture here and see that we have a corrective. You should not be able to come into church and go out of church and not be bothered by people. You should not be able to go into church and out of church without being bothered by people. Um, you know, it kind of goes both ways. Uh, uh, I know sometimes it's a common thing, and you know, you know the pastors. And Gary sitting there; he was a pastor for many, many years. Um, pastors will often uh, hear from people who come to a church, and they'll say something like, "You know, this place wasn't very friendly, or that place wasn't very friendly." I went in and out; no one said a word to me. And usually, my response is, "Well, did you say a word to anyone?" You know, because it, it, it's it, it's not just being it's not just having people bother with you. I mean, you've got to bother with other people too. It, it, it's got to be, it's got to be uh, both ways. But it, it's a problem, I think, in the in the church world because a lot of times, uh, folks are coming to church out of duty. 
or coming at, to church to alleviate guilt or um, somehow or another um, uh, dealing with just a, a habit that maybe they learned in childhood and just have really never ever um, broken from, which is a good thing, I think. But um, we, need, we need to understand that, that church is about the people in it. And so the attitude that we have and what we are seeking to connect with when we come to church has got to be not the pastor. That's all right. I, I, no. I love all your adulation. I love it when you clap for my jokes. I, I just really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, it's a, you know it's it's a it's a fantastic thing. But you know it shouldn't. It's not about it's not about the pastor, right? It's about the body. Uh, it's about the body, and so it, it's really it's really something that we're called to a higher level than what generally gets practiced. Um, now I think for the most part, I think this congregation does pretty well along the, the, those lines. Mm -hmm. um, um, I get, for the most part, I get really, really good comments about the folks that are in the church. Every now and again, you know, a, a, an outlying comment comes in and it's like, I wonder where that came from. Uh, I got one of those the, the couple of weeks ago, someone said, uh, you know, Pastor, that church is not very friendly. And I'm thinking, that's the first time I've heard that in 20 years. <laughs> you know, it's like, please. Uh, you know, uh, so, but I, I think it's something that we always need to just see that the Scripture tells us this is an important thing. We can't get slack in this area. Uh, when you come to church, be interested in the people that are in the church. Let the people in this church be interested in you. Let it go both ways. I'll let the practice of the, the tender familial love, brotherly affection, let be real and genuine, and um, not not uh, something that's that's uh, just part of a some kind of a formality. Um, you still with me on this? Yep. As we pop away these bullets, right? We just keep on hitting them. Uh, then we go to this uh, this next thing here. It says, "Honor one another above yourselves." That is not a bad rendering. You see here, it says, "In honor, preferring one another." Now. Uh, if you read this in the NIV, um, honor one another above yourself, you, you, you wouldn't get quite catch the flavor. It's not that it's a bad translation, but what it misses out on is this word that you see here, <coughs> preferring. That's actually there in the Greek. So when you see that preferring up there, that is, that's in the, the Greek phrase here, and so uh, it's meant to get across something. So what does it mean to honor one another? In other words, well, it means that you prefer the other person. Um, another, a, a way of seeing this, I think I put it up there. Yes, I did. Let the other one go first. So you're, you're almost deferring to the other person. Um, you know, uh, uh, sometimes we'll do that even in something like a fellowship meeting. I'll, I'll say something like, let all the mothers with children go first. All right? That's just a, a sense of preferring one another in love. Or sometimes I'll say, let everyone with gray hair go first. Of course, that leaves out the bold. It, when it says to, to, uh, to, to honor one another, uh, that, that's what, it, it, what it's meaning. It's not just that you are um, looking for, like calling everyone Mr. or Mrs. or Miss or, or Sir or anything else like that. That's really not what's in, in mind. Uh, and it's not uh, you know, it's not hang, handing out, um, you know, Dewey buttons for everything that you possibly can. You know, that happens with Little League now, right? Because, you know, competition is seen as bad, got to get rid of the testosterone, all, all of the kind of things that are very present in our woke culture today. Uh, and so, uh, everyone gets an award. You came to practice and you actually breathe there. You get an award. <laughs> That's like... You know what I got when I was in Little League? I got yelled at. <laughs> what are you doing there? <laughs> what what a what a, a difference fifty years makes, right? I mean, that's something else. Um, but anyhow, when it says to prefer one another, it means that you're that you are um, you're deferring to the other person. You're letting them have the privilege. You're letting them go first. Uh, and, and uh, you could say in a more general sense it would include what we have stated here in the NIV that you are honoring one another above yourself. 
But, but the, the, the real thing that it wants to get down to is putting that into a practice. Not just a generalization, but a practice, something that is specific enough and tangible enough to, to put into use. And when we say letting the other one go first, I think that really um, does justice to what's there in the Greek and brings it out in a way that says, ah, so that's what that means. I can do that. I can do that. So that's, that's what that is all about. Then it goes on, right? Keep on hitting these staccato lights. Uh, there's so many of them. You can tell that the Apostle Paul did not found the church at Rome. Because, I mean, he had to, like, unload everything he had in one letter. <laughs> uh, he, had, he had no uh, history with them. He had not ever taught them before. So he's taking this, he's taking this, this one shot, and he's just throwing the kitchen sink in there and everything else in there as well. It's not that it's bad stuff. It's just it's just a real, real whole lot of stuff, all kind of like packed into a, into just a few phrases. Uh, he says, "Never uh, in the NIV, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord." And you see here it says, "Never lacking in, in diligence, being fervent in spirit serving the Lord." Um, actually, two distinct phrases uh, in the Greek there, um, so not just packed into one thing like in the NIV. Uh, not, uh, not lagging in diligence. Now, diligence is a word I think most of us understand. Um, I guess, what was it, Oscar Wilde wrote to the importance of being earnest? I think it was him. She's the book, book reader. I'll ask her. Um, but, um, you know, that's really earnestness, diligence. Those things are almost synonymous. And it, what it means is ju just that, that you're not phoning it in. And again, I think that that's kind of a, a common trap that we can fall into because in evangelicalism over the last, I would say since World War II really, um, great strides have been made, I think, in, in systematically coming up with approaches to try to make sure that the populace that we live amongst hears the gospel. I mean, we can thank people like Bill Bright and Billy Graham and, and other folks that have been so... Uh, so foundational in that kind of uh, thinking, that kind of action. But at the same point in time, I think that, that in, in making those efforts, sometimes what happens is that we, uh, really quite unaware, I think, uh, give out a message that says, it's really important for you to come to Christ. Right? And we're so focused on that, that then we, we make it seem like you've crossed the hurdle that you have to cross. You've done all that can be done. You've reached the peak of Mount Everest. There's nothing left to climb. And the result of that, I think, is that somehow, sometimes what you see is that, that people excitedly turn to Christ, and then their diligence and their earnestness sloughs off. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you have, you have a good and a bad, right? It, it, has, it has the movement toward a much more uh, systematic evangelism than good? Well, I think that it has, but, but packed in there is that there, that, that little secret hidden problem that there is that we've got to make sure that we say turning to Christ is not the end of the road. It's the beginning of the road. And we have got to never be lag, lacking in diligence if we're going to uh, follow the biblical mandate uh, to follow after Christ in faith. So uh, we have that, and then, as I said, we separate it here because in the Greek, it's, it's, they're not all packed into one thing. Being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Um, fervent, uh, you probably have a really good understanding of what that word is. If you don't know the literal, uh, the rendering of a word that's translated fervent in, in English, the Greek word means boiling. And so you have... What does it mean to be fervent? It means to just be roiling with energy, uh, dedicated, focused. Um, you know, it's not just heat, but focused heat. You know, lasers are like that in a matter of speaking, right? They, they're very focused light beams, and you can get those things delivering a lot of heat. Um, you can burn through stuff 
uh, with powerful lasers. And so, you know, that's more along the concepts of what's being dealt with here, is that this is the way that we ought to, we ought to step. This is not Revival Week. This is not Sunday as opposed to Monday through Saturday. This is just all the time, 24-7. This is, this is just what we uh, need to embrace as, as like a, a principle that's part of guiding our lives is that we're going to maintain a fervent spirit while we serve the Lord. And, you know, serving the Lord, um, that sounds like a, a tired phrase in the matter of speaking. Now, what are you up to? Well, I'm serving the Lord. End of conversation, right? <laughs> if you're talking to somebody in the world, certainly that's that's the case. But, um, you know, I, I think... I think that there, there's a certain mundaneness about that expression and phrase. Um, maybe that's why that we need to have the the uh, uh, the added uh, input of saying remaining fervent in spirit. Because you know when you think about serving the Lord, you can see where that can get hung from. Well, you know you start going through motions, repetitive motions in particular. You know a, a lot of a lot of our Christ, Christian practices, right? Coming to church. Doors are open, we come to church. Half the time we don't need to think about it if the habit is that well instilled. And it, just when you do that kind of thing, it's, it, you know, it, it is easy for there to be service of the Lord, but not fervency in spirit. And what we need to do somehow or another is both. We need to, we need to do the you know, work a day, humdrum, mundane, matters that come into serving the Lord and we need to do it with some zeal. Because if if in doing even the simple things we can get we can allow ourselves, excuse ourselves from getting sloppy and lazy about those things or not really um, attentive in those kinds of things, it'll spread. Right? It, that's a uh, apathy uh, is a disease that spreads. It may be, you may think it's just in this little area of life, no big deal, but if, if that's there in something that has to do with how you're connected to the Lord or how you're responding to the Lord, it will not stay in the little space that it shows up. It's like a cancer. It'll start. So it's just one of these things that we have to um, be aware of and you know, come, come here and get machine gunned by the Apostle Paul every now and again. So we hear all these things and say, wow, there's a whole lot more to being a Christian than I thought. I thought I just had to sit in these nice, comfortable pews and listen to that little guy go on and on and on up there. But no, there's a little more to it than that. Um, all right, we, we, uh, we keep on moving on here. It says, be joyful in hope. Joyful in hope. Um, I... I I think, a, I think that a literal rendering of this is a little more exciting, and that's what you have behind me, right? Uh, re, uh, what it says that we be joyful in hope, and you see in hope rejoicing, they're not quite the same, are they? Um, when you think of something like be joyful in hope, you think joy is something that you are willfully chasing after to somehow or another, you know, put into this thing that you have working inside you called hope. But that's really not the picture. That's really not the picture at all. Um, the picture is that you have hope in Christ and you give room, you allow it to be something that impels rejoicing in you. And so, um, if you think about it, what, are, what is the, the center of hope that we have in Christ? Well, the first thing that we have is that Christ is going to come back. He, he's, not going to be, he's not going to be harmless Jesus like he was the first time that he came, right? He's, he's going to be awesome. <laughs> and when I say that, I mean in the most literal sense, the, the etymologically wise of the word awesome. He's going to be scary and power and glory, right? It's going to be like that. And uh, 
uh, you know, what is it that you want? You want him to look at you with a smile and say, well done, good and faithful. Man, it's good to see you. I'm really happy to have you with me. That is, that is our hope, and maybe I would say our primary hope as Christians is that we have come to know Christ and that he knows us. And the important part about that, I think, is demonstrated in Matthew chapter 7. Right? When you're coming out of the tale of the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about false prophets. And they'll want Jesus basically to give them a doggy treat. And he says, go away from me. I don't know you. I don't know you. And so nothing is really more imper uh, important than for a person to come to a personal knowledge of Christ. Not knowing about Jesus, but having, um, having a sense that you actually are yielded and surrendered and in that connection is made. And so Christ is more than an idea, more than a concept, more than a theological point. Christ is a person to whom you are engaged with relationally. Right? And so, you know, that's 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 I I, I think the, the primary hope that we have. Now a lot of people say, I just want my sins forgiven. And I, you know, okay, I understand that, but at the same point in time, forgiven for what? What come, you know, what's the point of having your sin? I don't want to go to hell. Where, where do you want to go? Well, I don't want to go to hell. Well, yeah, okay, again, I understand that. But, you know, uh, you're talking eternity here. That's a whole long period of time not to have any goals or ambitions. <laughs> I just don't want to go to hell. <laughs> I, it's a little silly, I guess, in, in concept, but what I'm trying to get, get across is, is that um, your sins forgiven is just something necessary that has to happen on the way, but what it's all about is coming to the knowledge, personal knowledge of God, coming to a personal relationship with Christ. That's what it's all about. And so that's what, what uh, our hope is. What else is our hope? Our hope is that we'll be transformed day by day after the image of Christ. Not something we can do by our own will or by the determination of a human being, but because God puts his Holy Spirit in us and the transformation process begins in us when we turn to Christ, we have a hope that, that as we go on we'll get to experience life in which we are less like we used to be and more like Christ. That's a good hope. right? And so we have these hopes, and they are, in some sense, uh, the anchor, the, the core, they're, they're, they're so connected to what we would call faith, they're inseparable from the corpus of it. And in that hope, what is, you know, what is the result of that? Well, I'm a friend of Jesus, I'm being transformed after his image, I'm going to be with him for all eternity, uh, you know, and what comes out of that is a spring of living water, joy, and, and just satisfaction like nothing else can satisfy. And so that's, that's really what we have. we have. We have a hope, a hope that's centered in Christ. And out of that hope, what comes out of us? What is set loose in us? Rejoicing. It's not that we have to go searching for rejoicing. It's that if if the hope is truly there, the hope of a deepening relationship with God, the hope of transformation in the Holy Spirit, the hope of uh, a life serving in eternity with Christ, um, when you have that, the joy comes with it. You know, just get the roadblocks out of the way, and, you know, let it flow. Um, it almost sounds like an Eric Clapton song or something, right? Uh, <laughs> let it flow. Uh, but um, it, this is this is what it's talking about in hope and rejoicing. It's not telling you, um, you know, it's not telling you to go chasing after rejoicing. It, it's telling you that if you're in hope, let it bring out rejoicing, which is a slightly subtle. You, are you hearing that that difference? Uh, again, what does it say here? Um, Joy, be joyful in hope. Uh, it's not saying being joyful in hope. It's, it, it actually, literally, it says be rejoicing in hope. So, uh, all right.
Uh, so uh, we go on to the next uh, the next phrase here. You still with me? Yeah. All right. Uh, it says uh, that um, we are patient in affliction. Patient in affliction. Um, just to unpack that, you can see that that's not a bad way of rendering it, incidentally, that we have in the NIV, not bad at all. Um, but just to unpack that a little bit, you see that we got very literal in the slide um, so that we understand exactly what, what uh, the affliction that's being talked about here is. Um, now when it says that we are uh, patient, it means persevering. And the concept there is that we're lasting, uh, we're not, um, we're not um, impatient, we're not uh, chomping at the bit, we're not getting nervous. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things in life can, can kind of give us an opportunity for those things to kind of come out of us. But what, what Paul is saying here is that, that as Christians, um, that's not what we're, how we're meant to, to live. That's not how we're meant to experience life. Uh, instead, we're meant to be uh, patient uh, in, in, uh, in affliction. So not nervous, not chomping at the bit, uh, none of those things, but uh, uh, we are steady and uh, persevering. And then affliction, uh, this word is uh, used a, a lot, uh, uh, philipsis. Uh, it is a word that means pressure. Uh, it's translated tribulation often. Um, in fact, uh, uh, you know, when Jesus talks about there will be tribulation, uh, this is what he's talking about, pressure. Pressure. And so when you get those two things together, the external experience of pressure and the internal uh, experience of patience. Patience being perseverance, not, not being rattled, not getting edgy, not getting nervous, not getting antsy. This is, this is what the combination of things that we're looking at. Um, and then we move on. He says, uh, uh, faithful in prayer. Faithful in prayer. What he means here is persistent. Persisting. Now, you know, the, the, the famous uh, uh, passage that Paul uses in, in Thessalonians, uh, in, one, uh, in uh, Thessalonians literature, of course, is um, unceasing prayer. And, you know, that's always a stumbling block sometimes in trying to figure out what unceasing prayer is. And I think that I've, I've steadily tried to teach that as this, is not that he meant 24 hours of prayer, but he meant that in whatever space in 24 hours that you pray, not letting that stop from your life. So, you know, um, some folks like to pray at certain times in the day. Some folks pray when other things are going on, like uh, say they have to, they're on the bus you know, going to work. And they may pray during that. Or uh, um, I try to walk every day, just about every day anyhow. When I'm walking, I'm at, uh, you know, often praying. Um, I can walk without thinking. Believe it or not, I can't do that and chew gum. <laughs> that causes problems. I'll bite the side of my mouth if I try that. But I, I can walk without thinking, which means that I can pray while I'm walking. And so, you know, if you have an activity that is not, is not really uh, taxing your consciousness, uh, it can be an opportunity to pray. But the thing that's important is to be persistent in it. To, to always get back to it, to always come to it, to not, to not let it lapse, to not let it uh, go on vacation. And incidentally, that's, that's a, an opportunity for me to say, when you go on vacation, pray. <laughs> you, know, you, should, you, should do the, you should do the things that you do to keep your spiritual vitality when you're not on vacation. You should do those things when you're on vacation. So. Do you pray when you're not on vacation to maintain your spiritual vitality? Well, yes, you do. So what do you do when you're on vacation? Yes, keep on praying. Do you read the Bible to maintain your spiritual vitality when you're not on vacation? Yeah, sure you do. So what should you do on vacation? Read your Bible. You go to church when you're not on vacation. So what should you do when you're on vacation? Should you go to church? I would say if you can, you, you know, you certainly should. Um, uh, and believe it or not, now I got Seth out there. He's 
Well, I guess you've gone on a few vacations with us too, and I know you guys do it on your own too. Um, when we're on vacation, we'll go to church. And of course, when the kids were young, you come to a church, right? Uh, you're you're a young couple with with uh, you know what four kids at that point in time. And, you know, if you're in a little country church out in the middle of nowhere, their eyes light, light up and they say, oh. <laughs> "Yeah." <laughs> Say, oh no, we're just on vacation, <laughs> and the face is sink. Oh. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we've had a, we've had a good opportunity to just be blessed. Uh, I remember we were at an Assembly of God Church down in Cape May. Um, we were down at the shore one time, and uh, that was a fantastic time in that church. Great, uh, just a great time of worship there. Spirit was really uh, the, the visiting, you know, laying laying low on the place, so to speak. Um, we've had, we were at church at the beach last time we were down at the shore, which was really cool. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a pretty cool concept. I mean, they just come and they plunk a little, like, lectern on the sand and have a few other things, a couple of tables and, you know, some little flaggy things and whatnot, and church right out there on the beach. And all the heathens are going by saying, those people don't belong on the beach. <laughs> And we're thinking, God bless you, brother. <laughs> Get him, <them>, God. <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we've uh, we've we've just had some some great experiences doing that. So I always like to encourage folks. In fact, i uh, when when it was common for churches to have bulletins, I used to say to people, when you go to church, bring a bulletin back for me because I you know I collect them, and I did at that point in time because I. You know, I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of ideas not even written in a magazine article or anything. It's a whole lot cheaper. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's uh, the, the experience of other brothers and sisters in a different place, you know, kind of even approaching things in a different way. It's, it's kind of a cool experience. And uh, it's all part of persevering uh, or being persistent uh, in prayer. Um, we go on. I better look at my watch. Yeah, we go on. For a little bit, anyhow. Um, he says, uh, "Share with the Lord's people who are in need." Again, that's a very good way of that's a very good way of rendering that the NIV has here. Um, share with uh, the Lord's people who are in need. Uh, what it says literally is contribute to the needs of the saints, and uh, this is something that I think is an important thing to remember because I. I really feel that sometimes church ends up being assaulted by the world around us, trying to tell us how to be Christians, and I just want to tell them to stick it in their ear. I'm, I'm a feisty pastor. Um, you know, oh, churches are so useless, they do nothing to help the poor. Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, on and on they go. Well, I mean, we can have arguments about who is really poor and who isn't. Uh, those kinds of things, I think, end up being irrelevant. But the one thing that I think is really centered on in, in the scriptures and something that, that we seem not to get is that if that the people sitting in the pews with you are in trouble, help them. You know, help them. And it's not, it's not that we want the world to starve or anything else like that. But often I think that we look right past what we're supposed to look at first, and we don't see it. Um, you know, that is something that we need to do. Uh, we're, not, we're not, the poor are always going to be amongst us. I mean, the communists think they can get rid of poverty. They don't, they just make it more widespread. That's a little bit of a joke, but it's a political one. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, there's just, you know, you've heard me talk about, about, um, the Tower of Babel and, and the Tower of Babel thinking. You know, that's what you get from the world. They don't want God in the picture. They don't want to submit to God. So they build a tower that basically says we don't need God. We can fix all of our problems. We can solve the you know, problems of poverty. We can solve the problems of family life. We can solve the problems of this, that, and the other thing. And we don't need to do it with God. And of course, it's always a disaster. Uh, as, is there anyone here who's still under the illusion that somehow or another the great society and all the programs that have brought in the, the, all of this so-called governmental help have, have done nothing but really made a really 
big lot of very rich uh, administrators that live in Washington, D.C. Do you know the average salary? And this was four years ago now. The average salary of a federal governmental worker working in the administrations down in the Washington, D.C. area was $117,000 a year. So, you know, my thought is, right there's the poor that, <laughs> that all of these programs are helping. And, uh, you know, $117,000 a year, I don't think that, I, it would be awful hard to justifiably call those people needy. Um, but, um, you know, there's a problem there. And uh, it's something that, that I think we can let the world kind of influence us and try to uh, get our eyes off what they need to be. The fact of the matter is, is that your brothers and sisters are the first place that you need to see need it. It's not, it's not like we want to expect that, that, but the fact is that brothers and sisters are going to be in need. And if we neglect that to join arms with some kind of crusade that doesn't have God in the center of it, we've neglected the thing that we ought not to have. Uh, share with the brothers in need. I remember one time, one of, one of the brothers in our church, one of, uh, one of the folks in our church, believe it or not, got arrested on a, a charge that, that put him in jail and it was because he trusted a friend who gave him something and it was stolen property. And because in his former life, he had a, he had a rap sheet. They don't ask what right? If you have a record, they don't ask you. <laughs> they just arrest you. And, uh, but anyhow, he's in jail and he had like, I don't know, $10,000 bond. And, and uh, I was thinking, man, there is just nothing I can do to help them at, at all. And somebody somebody else from the church called and said, I, I can't be sitting here in, in warmth and luxury while my brother's in jail. He went and paid his bail. Wow. And I said, Ooh, what a demonstration. I mean, yeah, that, that's some good stuff right there. So, you know, it's, it's uh, saints our brothers and our sisters. Um, charity starts at home, I guess is maybe the way I would say that. And we need we need to we always need to keep that in mind. Is there anything wrong with giving to Salvation Army? Uh, is there anything wrong with no, there's not. In fact I think those are really good things. We support things like like missions both in um, in Allentown and in Reddit both Hope Rescue Mission and Allentown Rescue Mission. And the reason that we support those things is that there's people who are homeless, there's people who are in trouble, there's people that haven't had a warm meal in a while, there's people who uh, don't have a roof over their head, and, you know, is that something that, that it behooves us to do something about? Yes, it is. Uh, and we don't want to stop doing that, but we do really need to pay attention to brothers and sisters in need and responding uh, to, to that. So,